Señoras y señores. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Jason Marzak, and I'm the senior director of the Adrian Arsh Latin American Center of the Atlantic Council. We are meeting today with a great deal of enthusiasm to undertake a conversation that is urgent and has to do with the dreams and aspirations of the Venezuelan people. It is an honor and privilege to be connected with you today while we kick off this series, Visions of Change, an initiative devoted uh, to hearing the different perspectives of the Venezuelan opposition movement. This conversation is being broadcast live in English. We're here this morning to give a warm welcome to a defender of democracy and a tireless voice for the Venezuelan people, Enrique Cabriles, a former governor of the state of Miranda, and two-time candidate to the presidency. His presence here is the beginning of a series of events that will bring together important leaders of the Venezuelan opposition, providing them a platform to share their visions, ideas, and strategies for a more brilliant future for Venezuela. For our series, Visions of Change, we are inviting all the pre-candidates of the Venezuelan opposition primaries, which according to credible polls, uh, have a rating of popularity or favorability that is over 15%. We have invited Maria Corina Machado, Benjamin Rauso, Delsa Solorzano, Manuel Rosales, and of course, Enrique Capriles, who is here today with us. Venezuela is at a crossroads. It is a nation that needs change, that yearns for renewed hope and a restoration of democratic principles, which are fundamental for its identity. Our series, Visions of Change, seeks to explore the multifacetic dimensions of this struggle and to show the efforts of the Venezuelan opposition in its quest for a free and prosperous Venezuela. This series is not only a series about hearing remarks, but uh, it is about trying to promote dialogue, comprehension, and collaboration. So the idea is to hear from Venezuelan opposition leaders who have devoted their lives to fighting for a Venezuela where the voice of the people are heard, where freedom prospers, and where prosperity is a shared reality. Throughout this series, we will delve into a variety of issues, the economic crisis, abuses of human rights, the humanitarian situation, and the future of democracy, seeking not only to understand the challenges, but also to amplify the solutions proposed by the Venezuelan opposition leaders. This morning, we are taking the first step by welcoming with us uh, Enrique Capriles. We'd like to avail ourselves of this opportunity to listen, learn, and unite our efforts in solidarity with the Venezuelan people. Enrique Capriles is a name that is synonymous with resilience and determination. He has been in the vanguard of the Venezuelan political scene for many years. His commitment to democratic values is well known to millions in Venezuela. This morning, we have the privilege of hearing his ideas, his experiences, and his vision for the future. We're going to begin uh, with um, some short remarks, and then I'm going to pose a series of questions to Mr. Cabriles so he can answer. And if there's enough time, we will also hear from the audience who can pose questions and they can do so on our website, askac.org. Uh, and we have Mr. Capriles with us from Venezuela. There may be some
um, technical difficulties because of the rain in Venezuela, but I'm going to give the mic to Mr. Capriles. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone who can see us. Indeed, I hope the internet connection uh, will be okay. It's raining very hard in Venezuela, so we hope that everything will go well. Well, I know that there are people who are connected from the United States, but also from other countries. And the re recurring question is, what is the situation, what is the real situation at an economic and social level in Venezuela? And those who are not Venezuelan, well, those people ask whether the country has gone forward economically. We don't have democracy here in Venezuela. We have to deal with the propaganda from the state, from those in power. And this works domestically and internationally. And so there's this idea out there that after the pandemic, that there has been um, a recovery of the economic sector, economic growth in Venezuela, and that has meant that Venezuelans have a better uh, have better living conditions now. But I want to be clear about what the situation is. And so the first thing is that I want to uh, shoot down that idea. That is not true. The best indicator that there has no there has been no economic recovery is if we look at the minimum wage and pensions and i want to tell everyone who is connected that the minimum wage and the pension in venezuela today 30th of may is less than five dollars a month more than five million people who are retired and get a pension have less than five dollars a month and with five dollars the retired those who have state pensions have to cover their food needs their uh, health needs um, housing everything that a person needs to have a decent standard of living. So a person who has an income of less than $5 a month is condemned to extreme poverty. And for me, that is the clearest indicator that in Venezuela, there is no economic recovery going on. There has been a dollarization of the economy in Venezuela, and that has translated to some economic progress, but most Venezuelans have watched how items have been dollarized. But most Venezuelans have not seen their wages or their pension be dollarized. So, in an economic context that is so difficult in a, such an unequal country, the pressing question is, what should we do? How can we find a solution? Undoubtedly, if we continue with the status quo, if we continue with the same policies, to maintain the status quo in Venezuela, the same rhetoric. The Atlantic Council is an organization that is based in the United States. And I'm sure that many who are listening and uh, watching us live in the United States. So I think it's important for the United States to know that we have not uh, had a recovery of democracy 
at this point, we have no assurances that we're going to have a competitive election next year. In other words, we need to shake things up. And if there is a political actor who has to make this happen, it is indeed the government of the United States of America. The policy towards Venezuela that has existed, we have to state this and we don't want to offend anyone. Um, and this is not about anyone in particular, rather, I'm just talking about the policies that the administrations uh, under Trump and Biden have had that were a continuation of the Trump administration's policy. I mean, there's been some tweaking, but really this has not given rise to positive outcomes and instead of recovering democracy, rather, there has been a weakening of the opposition, a strengthening of the Maduro government, and also suffering on the part of our people. And I've been told I have to be very, very concise. Um, my message from Caracas to the administration of the United States Oh, and those who are charged with uh, policy towards Venezuela, we have to move. We have to change. We can't continue to do the same because the result will be the same. In other words, a country that has not recovered its democracy, that has not had any governmental change, that has had an economic or going through an economic and social crisis, and the opposition at this time is seeking not to lose in 2024. And we want to shake things up. We need to change the policy that has been applied in recent years to Venezuela and to go beyond rhetoric and speeches, which uh, I'm sorry, I would respectfully say um, are not positive. And so I hope the connection has allowed you to hear me. Thank you, Capriles. The connection is perfect, even though it's raining in Caracas. I would like to begin with some questions about elections, proposals for the future of the country, and also a question about mobilization and unity. And then we will have questions from three guests. Let's begin now talking about the importance of these elections, of course, but also the weaknesses of the Venezuelan economy. Let's begin with the elections, though. I would like to start with that because after many years of abstention in the elections, the Venezuelan opposition is uh, coming back. Um, therefore, my first question would be, what do we need? Uh, what does it have to happen so that the elections in Venezuela are credible? What is the role to be played by the international community in order to promote fair and free elections? I believe in the power of voting because at the end of the day, that is the path that we Venezuelans have. During 2019, from the United States, and for some, it was actually kind of like a religious experience, formal sectors sectors that manage a lot of information that know history were sold the idea that in Venezuela there was going to be an action um, by force that was going to take Maduro out of office. However, whenever we talked with high-ranking authorities, North, uh, U.S. authorities, Many times we heard that in Venezuela there was not going to be um, 
military what operation if, or they were not go the United States were not going to use their armed forces to intervene in Venezuela. However, the idea was sold, uh, it was propaganda, I was told that that was going to happen, that such military action was going to take place. Such propaganda and such recurring message, but by certain groups within the United States, in my opinion, the only thing that managed to do was to weaken the democratic of opposition in Venezuela. I think some people in the, Atlant in, in the Atlantic Council know our critical position since 2019. Everything that was being done, especially after a specific date, it, it had been told that in Venezuela there was going to be some sort of mobilization of the Venezuelan armed forces that were was going to overthrow Maduro on the 30th of April 2019. Because of all that, um, it was said that the opposition had failed. And we were a critical voice. We were saying that in Venezuela, we needed to recover our vote uh, in spite of the adverse situations. We had to use democratic democratic elections to mobilize, to strengthen democratic sectors. The challenge was to achieve a political change uh, with a non, against a non-democratic regime. There are examples um, where there have been transitions toward democracy using elections. What are elections? What is democracy? For me, democracy is not only um, the power of, or the right uh, to vote. However, we need to exercise that vote, that right. Um, Venezuelans at that time were wrongly given the impression by certain governments uh, from abroad that there was going to be a magical solution to the problem. And it is more than clear that there is no magical solutions. It's all fantasy and it leads to a great deal of frustration for the Venezuelan population. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask you now about the economy. In your initial remarks, you said very important things about the importance or the lack of of money. Um, you mentioned five dollars a month for some Venezuelans. Uh, that means they don't have a lot of resources to um, cover their basic daily needs. And the question is, what to do? I have the question, the same question for you. If you were elected. Which ones would be your main priorities in order to address um, economic issues and recover economic growth? What would be your plans to address the economic problems that you have talked about? I didn't finish the answer to my to the first question, but I'm going to. Uh, Segue to the economic issue now. In Venice, but they're related. In, if in Venezuela we want to have competitive elections, um, in fact, I am one of those that believes that we can have um, an overwhelming um, victory. We can have we can win by knockout uh, using a metaphor from boxing. If we want to change things in Venezuela, we have to win by a knockout. But in order to have competitive elections in Venezuela, um, our competitive elections will actually allow us to have a change in the political situation, and that will allow us to address the economic problems. I think it's a mistake. And I, here I have a message for the US administration. The policy that tried to make the economic situation more difficult didn't succeed. The economic wor worsening is not a result of the sanctions, but sanctions are only useful today 
um, as a negotiation tool, weakening the economy or weakening the social uh, fabric will only distance us from having competitive elections. How can we recover the economy in Venezuela? We need to recover our main source of revenue. What is our main source of revenue? Oil. We need to recover our oil industry, our constitution, allows for strategic partnerships with the private sector in order to strengthen our oil industry. Now, an example, Chevron. Chevron is uh, working in Venezuela. Is it positive or is it negative? Obviously positive. And we hope to have other oil companies come and operate in Venezuela. Now, Venezuelans once again have been surprised with the corruption scandal in the oil industry. And what do I want to say here? Well, if it's harder to sell our main source of revenue, which is oil, the harder it is to, to sell oil, the more obscure the industry is, the only thing we're doing is um, feeding corruption. In, order, in other words, we need to promote transparency in the oil sector. We need, because putting obstacles to the oil industry doesn't really yield any good results. It's a false dilemma. One may think that if the economy weakens, then the opposition strengthens, and that's not right. I believe that it is clear that if in Venezuela we don't have gas, those that suffer are Venezuelans. It's not Maduro. That's why I would like to insist um, and repeat what I said at the beginning. We need to change the situation. We need the U.S. to protect the main asset that we have in the country, which is our oil. If the United States are partners of uh, uh, our democratic recovery, it is important to have that asset and make sure that that asset doesn't end up in the hands of creditors that will use it as an, uh, as an instrument for the electoral campaign of Maduro and against the opposition in Venezuela. If in the past uh, Cisco was protected, why not do so in now? And hence uh, my insistence on the following here in this conversation with the Atlantic Council. We don't really care much about domestic policy in the United States. We just want the United States to have the commitment to contribute to the Venezuelan solution. And the Venezuelan solution has to be among Venezuelans. And any type of agreement in the country needs to have the support of the United States so that it is not the United States uh, who plays a political role and decides what type of policy has to prevail domestically when looking or trying to achieve the democratic recovery in the country. Because in order to bring back democracy to Venezuela, it is not true that we don't need economic recovery. We need to take every single step in that direction. We need to recover our economy in order to also recover our democracy. Thank you very much, Mr. Capriles. I would like now to offer the floor to some of our guests so that they can ask their questions to you. Let's begin with uh, Adrian Delia. Adriana Delia is Venezuelan and she's a senior, a non-resident fellow here in the Adrian Harz Latin America Center. Adriana, go ahead. Muchísimas gracias, Jason, y Atlantic thank you Council. very much, Jason, and thank you to the Atlantic Council. Greetings uh, to Enrique Capriles and everyone here today. Following up on the conversation about how to recover the Venezuelan economy, we know that oil is and will continue to be the key industry in Venezuela. My question would be the following. PDVSA has a very difficult situation. They are have a very high debt um, and they are producing much less than what they were producing in 1998. What um, approach do you have in terms of oil policy and what is the future of PDVSA um, under your management? Thank you, Adriana. Mr. Capriles, go ahead. Well, I would talk here about oil as well as gas. 
as our main source of revenue. And since Venezuela is an oil producing company, a uh, country rather, the first thing that we need to do is to recover our main business. According to experts in the subject matter, we could have 20 more years of um, producing oil in Venezuela. Therefore, we have almost like a full generation ahead. Now, in terms of the foreign policy that we have seen over the last years, it's been positive in terms of the fact that we are continuing to sell oil and get revenue from it. However, what has happened? We have had to establish certain partnerships with some countries that are not really friendly to Venezuela and countries that do not have democratic regimes. That's why I said that we need to change the situation in order for us to recover the oil industry in Venezuela, we need to facilitate the recovery of the industry. And that can only happen if there is investment by the private sector in this industry. What type of investment in the oil industry do we want in Venezuela? We want... Do we want investment for example, from the United States or countries like the United States? Well, I believe the U.S. is a natural trade partner for Venezuela. And in addition to that, one of our main assets or our main allies is, or our main markets is the United States. Therefore, I think that would be the natural direct foreign investment in Venezuela. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary to have private investment in the oil industry in Venezuela. We Venezuelans, the country of Venezuela at this point does not have the economic capacity to actually do all the investment that the oil industry in Venezuela needs. Now, in order to attract foreign direct investment, we need to facilitate it. If there are restrictions to this type of investment, we won't have it. Um, accountability is important, um, supervision, no, no diversion of um, revenue, that, all those are challenges. The money generated by uh, our main source of revenue cannot end in the pockets of corruption. In the medida que hagamos más transparente el negocio, será menos probable que termine la corrupción. It will be easier to actually oversee the resources coming into the country. So the conclusion is that we are a petroleum producing country. We need to recover uh, this production. We need to diversify our economy because Venezuela not only has oil, it can also produce everything that its people needs. We can produce medications. And so we're not just a petroleum exporting country. Um, we can get into exports of other products, but it is currently insufficient given the large size of our country and we see that our minimum wage and our retirees pensions are under five dollars thank you very much mr capriles we have two more questions from special guests and i wanted to begin with ana vanessa herrero the correspondent of the washington post in caracas you have the floor madam i'm sorry ana we can't hear you you are muted I apologize. Hello. Hello. I wanted to be, uh, ask you about your disqualification from running for office. Um, you are disqualified, but we're headed up to the primaries and we want to know how effective can that be 
running uh, in the primaries if you don't know what's going to happen later and if you can actually run for president. Perhaps you might be a candidate, uh, but perhaps it'd be better that you supported another candidate given that you've been disqualified from running for office. Um, do you think that you will at some point have that reversed? Thank you. Please go ahead. As Ana Vanessa knows, we are not in a democracy here in Venezuela. There's no uh, democratic system. There's no respect for the rule of law. And it's clear that there are no guarantees. We are fighting so that we can have the rule of law, so that we can have guarantees for all, not just for political actors, rather for everyone, economic, social actors, and the Venezuelan people. In Venezuela, all Venezuelans have been disqualified in a way. The public health sector, for example, if someone uh, is sick, a patient, they go to the hospital and they say, well, we, know ha we don't have doctors to care for you. Well, that means you've been disqualified when you can't get gas into your car because of the long lines. Well, you're being negated or disqualified. So from a political point of view, there's no one uh, who can know whether if they run, then tomorrow the government might disqualify them from running. So I'm not going to disqualify myself from running. I think that would be an incredibly terrible error because that would mean uh, we'd go back to abstention, as Ana Vanessa knows about. I'm not going to go there. And there's an example. The last elections that were held in Venezuela, you can see the map behind me in Venezuela. There, in Varinas, this is a state that's right here in Venezuela. That's a state which for the last 20 years has been in the hands of the government party. In other words, Hugo Chavez's party. And it was always governed by this party. However, in 2021, the opposition won in that state. And this was recognized by the Electoral Council that the opposition had won. And the Supreme Court of Justice disqualified the candidate who had won, and then new elections were convened for January the following year in disqualifying the winner. The candidate ran again, won again, and again disqualified. The opposition, however, uh, well, they decided to fight. No, we're going to fight. We're going to run in those elections in the worst circumstances. There were no electoral observers from the European Union, which after 15 years, we were able to get them to come for local and regional elections in 2021. When the opposition candidate who, who won decided to have his wife run, who had never uh, run for office. She was also disqualified. And then a third candidate ran, also disqualified from running. And finally, it was the fourth candidate who ran for the elections and won overwhelmingly. So it was practically impossible for the government to disqualify him. 
Um, and given his overwhelming victory, they finally accepted the results. And the governor of Ardina is in the hands of the opposition. So what do I want to what do I mean by this, Anna Vanessa? It's likely that they throw up roadblocks today, tomorrow, and when the elections are about to take place. But we should not renounce our vote. There are people who did not vote uh, on 21 November. They did not participate in elections. And now they are presenting themselves as candidates for the primary. And they say they're the voice of the opposition. And we must be clear and transparent. We don't know if what they're seeking is to see who's in the opposition and then take us on a path to boycott the elections. And I want to be clear and transparent. This goes beyond anyone's candidacy. This is a policy that believes in the vote, that believes in majority vote, so that the majority uh, in this country, the poorest in Venezuela, the middle class who has suffered so that they can exercise their vote and so that we can have elections where there is an overwhelming victory of the opposition so that there can be a different administration. I think that we should not lie to the international community or Venezuelans. I think we need to talk about where we're going, who we're facing, and what are the conditions that we need to fight for so that we do not lose out on a great opportunity in 2024 as long or provided that there is an agreement so that the elections in Venezuela are free and fair uh, so that they are useful for Venezuelans and the international community. And we need to also talk about forced migration that have made millions of Venezuelans flee from their country because of the opportunities they cannot find in their homeland. Thank you very much. Finally, Regina Garcia, who is a correspondent for Associated Press. She has the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. My question is about voters, average voters, not those who go to these um, rallies those who want to resolve the problems of their daily lives and who are tired of the same talking points, the same promises, including the talk about economic sanctions, which they do not connect up with their daily difficulties. Why are those voters, uh, uh, the, a worker for Pedavesa or a teacher who sees their um, students not able to perform because they don't have food at home. Um, why should they vote in the primaries? And under, uh, well, how would you characterize the primaries as successful? I mean, is there like a certain percentage of people that need to uh, participate? I mean, it's difficult because the opposition, of course, is divided. Thank you, Regina. I think that that's a wonderful question. It's very timely. It's clear that in a country where the minimum wage and retirement pensions are under $5 a month, what a worker earns in the US in an hour, less than an hour, that is the monthly pension of a person who is retired. And I think that clearly shows what the economic social situation is in my country. In midst of an economic crisis and a breakdown of the social fabric, people focus all their efforts and energy on obtaining food, on obtaining medicines and other basic needs. Regina, 
that doesn't mean that people are resigned, but in Venezuela, and I think it's a normal process, we see that people are worn out. This is a country where there are divisions and there are partisan politics that we see and hear 24 hours a day. I don't think there's any country in the world where, they, where politics is talked about more than in Venezuela. Morning, noon, and night, all the conversations, family dinner conversations about politics. The politics, is, well, politics, that's the conversation when we go to the beach. It's not normal. What's normal is that you talk about politics just a little bit. Now, I think that most people are going to become more interested in participating in elections as they become closer. And in our last regional local elections, the percentage of people who went to the um, to the polls was a normal percentage. This is a presidential system. And that's when most people do go to vote. Now, your question about the primaries. Well, I don't have current data available to me. But I know there are some groups that have been researching this issue and more than 80%, maybe 85% of Venezuelans don't even know about the primaries. They don't even know they exist, but they do want unity. And we can't think that the primaries are going to resolve the problems of a divided opposition. And we're in an unequal fight. We have to remember that we don't control the media, we don't control the radio, we don't control public TV, we have connectivity problems. To think that we're on the same footing as the government in this fight, in this struggle, well, no way. So people want unity. But let's not think that the primary is going to resolve all these problems. The primary needs to be an instrument to be able to drive the opposition, to give us an opportunity. This is a country that is demanding change. I don't think that because we have no people or there aren't these huge protests in the street that people have thrown in the towel. I think that would be a an erroneous reading of the situation here. How do we ensure a successful primaries? It can't be a VIP primary. It can't be a primary for a specific uh, stratum of our people, for the people who are from the high class, in other words, that have gas, that have cars, that can travel. We need a people's primary, one that includes everyone in Venezuela. And it's not true, as people have tried to say that's going to be an intervention uh, by Maduro or the Electoral Council in the primaries. That's not true. The Electoral Council, there are five members on that council and two are committed to democracy. Two people who weren't there before. And they are the eyes overseeing the Electoral Council and the logistics of the election. And we shouldn't give that to um, Maduro as a gift. We can use that electoral institution. I, I wouldn't dare say this percentage of Venezuelans will be going to the primaries, 
but a VIP primary where only, you know, the upper class goes to the primary, well, that's not going to be useful for the opposition. So I want a primary where there's broad participation, where the most humble Venezuelans go, people who live in remote neighborhoods go, the retirees go, Mr. Capriles, I'm sorry, given the time, we need to finish up uh, with this question. So thank you very much for that clear, clear answer. For, for su tiempo, for su... Uh, thank you for your time, for your response, for... And for your leadership at the same time. And I would like to offer the floor to Jeff Ramsey, a fellow senior, a, for, a senior fellow for Colombia and Venezuela, who will wrap up this conversation. Once again, thank you very much, Mr. Capriles, for your dedication and for your struggle. And Jeff, you have the floor. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Capriles, for your participation in today's event. And thank you, Vanessa, Regina, and Adriana, for your excellent questions. And definitely thank you all for having connected to here to this session with us this morning. This conversation, this discussion has given us a renewed commitment uh, to the Venezuelans. And that was the idea precisely of this first event of the series Visions of Change. Uh, it's a pleasure to announce that our next event of this series will um, have the uh, leader of the op opposition, Maria Corinama Machado. We will be here on the 12th of June at 12 p.m. DC time and Venezuelan time, where we will continue to explore the possibility of a democratic change in Venezuela. I would like to reiterate once again, that as Jason said, for this series, we are inviting all the pre-candidates of the primary um, elections uh, for the opposition. According to reliable um, surveys, the, their um, polls indicate that they have more than 15 percent of um, acceptance among uh, people, Venezuelans. Thank you very much for being part of this dialogue that we are trying um, to foster in order to so find a democratic solution to the crisis in Venezuela. Thank you.